Hello everyone. Um, today we're going to start a new chapter of this of this batch structural summit. Uh, the past two days we talked extensively about education beyond the pandemic, uh, but now we're also looking beyond uh, the education. Throughout history, work and employment have always been changing. Definitely in times of great turmoil in politics, economy, environment, or any other uh, societal changes, the way we work evolves. Right now, living through the global crisis will, of course, also have its effect. In order to uh, introduce these topics, I have uh, three lovely people here with me. Uh, first is Davide from uh, uh, Italy. Uh, he's the current president of the Best Alumni Network. Uh, we also have uh, Vale from Lyon. Uh, he's the current cor uh, corporate relations department coordinator in Best. And we have uh, Fleur from Belgium, who is the current donations project coordinator. Uh, I would like to ask, ask all three of you uh, to tell uh, all of us what do you think will be the biggest change in work and employment after the pandemic? Uh, I'll start then. Um, so uh, I, I think that, uh, okay, this is of course a very big uh, field, but uh, I think the main change that we will see is the, the change in uh, the percentage of remote working. Uh, I think that in general, we will have more people um, working remotely and we will have uh, um, yeah more flexibility from the companies like in in a general trend now this can be split in different ways and also the survivability of the companies will be uh, determined by this so one thing that uh, uh, that can make a, a difference is the culture of the company. So there will be some companies that I think will be more open and some that will maybe uh, push more of the people to come back to the office. The big companies have the luxury to do this. So I'm not sure how this trend will go. Regarding the small companies, I think that the ones that will adapt better to the situation are more likely to survive and are more likely to uh, eventually thrive while the the ones that couldn't adapt i am afraid that may fail may just close and i am not sure that this will give space for new ventures to to come out because i don't know how much the economy will shrink so generally the small companies are you know covering the gaps and maybe those gaps will not be there anymore at least like for a certain period but we don't know so we need to see how it works. Yeah, it will indeed have quite an effect on the, the global macroeconomy and uh, on larger corporations. Thank you, David. Cheers. 
Um, Vale, would you like to also weigh in? Maybe I can go next. Uh, well, to, to build a bit on what Davide said, uh, I totally agree with his vision of, of work from home and uh, this, this competitivity between uh, big and small companies that can adapt fast. Uh, I think in general, the place of the office will change a lot uh, in, the, in the near future. And we've seen this with now companies getting online, most of them. So no, I think the office won't be just an infrastructure in which you meet with your fellow colleagues, you work together, but maybe on completely different projects. And you know, sometimes you share a cup of coffee, uh, but it may actually be way more than this. So I uh, envision companies cutting a bit, for example, on infrastructures that are not necessary and invest on infrastructures that uh, engage more collaborative work, uh, more um, client engagement too, and, and all these aspects. Uh, the second thing I think that is really important in developing is uh, digitalization. And this will also impact a lot of students in terms of the, the learning process that they will have to go through to, to keep pace with uh, the fast change in, in work nowadays. And uh, potentially in the, in the future years, we'll see a massive, uh, like massive change in this area of, of learning and, uh, and improving ourselves. Yeah, definitely the, the individual experience of, of being at work will change quite a bit. Definitely now that we've seen some changes happening during the pandemic and the follow up of that is, is uncertain. Uh, Fleur? Yeah, I would really would like to compliment what Vale and Davide already said. Um, I also believe firmly that remote work will be uh, in an uplift uh, in the coming days and months and years even. Uh, I also see that this might have a very beneficial um, role in our environment. Uh, so uh, regarding sustainable, uh, sustainable environment, we are certainly having a, a good impact if, it's, uh, if we're all remote working. So that's why I also think that there will exist uh, new forms of employment, actually. So employment that happens from home, employment uh, based on maybe uh, sort of uh, tender projects or uh, of, um, how do you say it, uh, when you um, have your own business that like small people will work from home on their own, but that other people can uh, uh, hire them for doing specific tasks. So I think we will see a lot of this uh, as big companies also need to adapt. They will uh, try to have these smaller startups, let's say, uh, to, to help them in this process. And really the employment will change a lot. It, I also see that this um, local, uh, of local environment will become way more important for us. And that's uh, what Vali said about the uh, office being very valuable. I think it will be a, a valuable place to go to if you need to uh, change your location, you just go to the office for some quality time. And I think that will be uh, one of the greatest uh, changes in, in work and employment. Yeah. Um... I think definitely we're, we're seeing that there will be probably a large change. Um, some of the changes were already going on for decades and now will be fast-tracked. Some new changes will happen, uh, obviously, based on solely this, uh, this single occurrence. Um, during the next few days, we will definitely all hear a lot more uh, from uh, experts in all the fields. We, we can't discuss the whole extent of the change in, in work and employment in just a few minutes. Um, however, we are also here uh, mostly as, as young people, as students or young graduates. Um, and that's why I would like to ask uh, the, the three of you, uh, what can young people do to be engaged in this? And, and why also is it very important that they are? So I'll start again. Uh, um, I think uh, that is very important for, uh, for young people to, to be engaged uh, in, uh, in this situation. This is one of the most, like I think most clear example of how being uh, uh, being uh, updated on what's happening in the environment around you is uh, is critical for you to make your choices so uh, being uh, uh, being updated on the situation uh, and on what the trends are for the various companies and for the market in general will allow you to understand what uh, what resources like you need to um, 
yeah, to invest. Like let's say how much you need to learn, what skills you need to um, to develop in order to keep being competitive, because you know, it, it, like we are we are in a competitive world, and of course, who adapts faster um, is um, is always an advantage. Um, there is another point that is not only uh, you know being updated, but also uh, frequenting the hubs where these changes are actually discussed. You may even you may even influence what the future will be. So uh, yeah, accessing, uh, accessing those hubs and being actively like involved in the discussion may actually shape what are the environment like uh, what environment you will you will be on later on. Yes, definitely. Uh, individual action in, in shaping your own your own future will be as important as ever, or more important than ever. Um, Fred, would you like to complement something? Yeah, I would like to say that, um, as Davide said, it will be very important to adapt and to for each individual, uh, or each individual young person, to uh, shape their skills uh, in 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 order uh, of what the new employment will will offer, um, and. Uh, for this, I think that young people are uh, in an advantage. Uh, uh, they they really have a position where they can uh, see and reflect on the world in a in a very uh, open way. They're they're still not um, tied to one uh, vision. They are very open uh, to new things. So that's uh, really an advantage. And also the drive that young people have will be uh, what they can put into this uh, change in uh, work and employment. They can put their drive into this. They can put their vision into this for the future because they will shape the future. They will be the future. And yet they also will have their own uh, children one day and then that will just make sure that they really are just uh, the ones who shape the future and the ones who can now start thinking about all these changes that need to be done. Yeah, young people, as always, will have to be change makers in, in many ways, uh, as we're well saying. Um, vale. Yeah, I think it's super important to, to consider this, that they will be the future. And just for this reason, you know, they, they shouldn't be passive, uh, especially right now. They should be proactive in everything they're doing. So as Davide said earlier, they should be proactive in, uh, in learning, in getting new experiences, experiences of the world, experiences of uh, the, the skills that they may want to have in the future. So, you know, taking part in activities in their schools, for example, uh, in student organizations like we're doing here, uh, can really, really help to build their skills. And I think right now we have more and more opportunities on that aspect too. Uh, more and more companies are hosting boot camps, workshops, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's really valuable. And I, I really encourage students to, to go uh, to, to that side and, and try to experience things. Um, but the other, other thing is uh, proactivity on the external world also. So you, you both also guys said this, but I think it's super important to have uh, an understanding of, of what are the problems in the world right now. Uh, in sustainability, in, in uh, equality in the workplace, and also understanding that maybe in the future, uh, work is going to change drastically. The skills required to be a worker now uh, are completely different than the one that will be the, the case in, uh, in 10 years. So it's super important to understand this, take part in conversations and conferences. Uh, and, and that's why I think uh, student organizations also like, like ours, but like also a lot, a lot of different student organizations are super valuable because they help the students make a first step in this understanding of uh, the global world that we live in. Yeah, indeed, uh, as what I'm saying, we need to also not look only towards our shape, shaping our own future, but towards shaping the, the whole uh, system in, in a way that we or the people after us will be part of. And indeed, we are also here, not just as individuals, but also as part of, of student as or associations, uh, either the best alone network or, or best. Um, so I'd like to ask, uh, how can we as, as NGOs uh, help make sure that there is a proper collaboration between all the relevant people, all the relevant bodies that need to be involved in the changes in work and employment? So, uh, 
as uh, yeah, I, I liked a lot what Vale uh, said. Uh, like uh, the, the NGOs are a good uh, a good place for the students to to train themselves uh, and to to be adaptable. Uh, so yeah, this is uh, actually a good uh, a good way to <laughs> to see one utility of the uh, of the organization. Uh, but I think like what uh, what is critical now from um, uh, like something that the organization uh, organization themselves should change is to have uh, some dedicated efforts in finding who are the people uh, or the departments that uh, especially the big companies dedicated to this crisis. So I expect that every major company has some dedicated channel, uh, some dedicated. Uh, something <laughs> um, and um, once like uh, all of the you know like all the information is gathered uh, is gathered from uh, these sources and from other sources that could be uh, political organizations or uh, humanitarian organization or, or neutral ones let's say uh, like uh, having a summary of all of this information in a structured way and then propose this um, this filtered information to their target, because they will know what you know what the target that their audience is. So, for example, invest will be technology students. Uh, they will for sure uh, need more a, cer a certain subset of this information rather than the whole um, noise that that could be uh, in a situation like this. Thank you, uh, thank you, David, for this uh, for this perspective. I also saw that Fleur uh, has something to add here. Uh, yes, I I just actually it was still on on Vale's point from before uh, that we still uh, that we need to look to the outside also as NGOs uh, that we need to look to the outside, but also what uh, Davidi said about um, having this uh, look at companies and having uh, like this broader perspective, I think it's very important for NGOs. And I believe that they can be the connection, that they can shape uh, events uh, by connecting people. So they are the ones who can bring to people together. They are the ones who can bring uh, like different generations, different nationalities. They can all uh, bring them together in events, whether they be online or offline events. Um, like nowadays, maybe online events will boom, but uh, still it's, it's this connection role that's very important. And I think that every individual that is linked to an organization should be aware of, um, hey, I am in this organization, but I am I should also look outside my organization and, and try to connect with other people. And that's what I find very valuable uh, for the future. Yeah, definitely. There's strength in numbers in many ways, and but it is also very important to to not limit yourself to just uh, what you know already, uh, and look further to understand what lies ahead. Uh, vale, would you like to add something as well? Uh, yes, I mean, I, I really liked first the idea of like having uh, an an organization, student or not, as a, a stream of information that corresponds to your needs. Uh, so the organization is here to filter all the information in the world and target them to what you care about. Uh, you may care about different stuff. You may be in different organizations, but that's a really interesting way to see things and to get what you need uh, out of this world where information flows are, are uh, enormous. Uh, but the other thing I think that makes uh, organizations such like ours um, so powerful is to bridge this gap that we still have between universities and, and the workplace. Um, so I believe uh, you know, companies are trying to, to shorten that gap more and more. Uh, they are trying to host workshops, uh, as we said earlier, in, in universities. They're they are really trying to merge, basically, somehow the workplace and the university to have a continuous flow. But I believe it is tremendously difficult, also because as teachers in universities, as researchers and so on, sometimes it's difficult to be really completely connected with what is happening in the workplace. And this is where I think student NGOs like BEST uh, are really powerful to make this bridge actually happen and to allow, I'm, I'm thinking about some of our events where we allow uh, companies to host specific events with students and, and we foster this collaboration with the universities, with the companies all together to make sure that uh, students are learning the proper skills 
and that things are moving fast because move, like changing institutions like uh, like universities for example can sometimes be really slow and it's normal they're they're massive they've existed for for years whereas we are more flexible than this uh, since we're we're young we're students and we're of course way smaller so we can make this change happen much faster in my opinion yeah, while the rest of society is, is catching up, while the large institutions are changing uh, the, their direction, we can, in the meanwhile, uh, do what is needed and, and guide the change in the right way, try some things. Uh, this is a really very interesting perspective. Um, this is in the end also why we're here in, in the virtual summit, for, for us as students to take action proactively, to, to see what we can do to improve the situation, to see what we can do to make sure that young people know where to go uh, after this as much as they can. Uh, for this, we will have uh, quite many interesting things going on uh, in the next two days when it comes to work beyond the pandemic. Uh, vale, can you uh, explain to our viewers what they can expect to happen? Sure. Uh, so first of all, well, I'm delighted to be responsible of the partnerships. Um, of course, I really want to have a big thanks also uh, to, to Daniel that worked really hard to, to get the speakers and, uh, and also Walid. Uh, so I, I think we really have a lot of beautiful speakers, amazing sessions. Um, most of them will be some keynotes. Uh, I think it's a, a bit like a TEDx talk, but with more focus on uh, our vision of society, I would say. Um, so really interesting keynotes from uh, leading organizations and institutions as in the past days for education, um, thinking about the World Economic Forum, IBM, B Engineering, et cetera, et cetera. So we have a lot of keynotes uh, on those two next days on, on work. Um, then we have some panel discussions. I think they're really interesting. I don't know if you guys had the occasion to go to the, the two ones uh, that, we, that we had previously, but I personally really enjoy them and I'm really looking forward to, to the new one that we'll have today. And finally, uh, something new that we didn't have so much, we had one, uh, but that's all. We are going to have quite a lot of workshops on this uh, work beyond the pandemic subtopic in those two days. So tomorrow we'll have two workshops. I really invite all the students to, to go and register for those workshops because those are sessions that are not uh, open to everyone. Let's say we have a limited number of participants. So I really suggest you guys to, to take a look, uh, to apply. They are really cool. And uh, also tonight we have a networking uh, night with some of our partners. So as always, I really suggest you all to, to take a look, apply. Uh, if you don't know where to find it, just go on the website on the work beyond the pandemic little uh, subtopic and you'll find everything here, all the information needed. And otherwise you can just approach us in the comments, I think, and, uh, and we'll be delighted to help you find the sessions that fit you the best. <laughs> all right, thank you, Vale. Um, that's, uh, that is it for now. Uh, in 10 minutes, the first keynote will start. Oh, nine minutes, the first keynote will start from the World Economic Forum. Uh, it will be on the same channels. So uh, I hope you will all stay tuned. And I for sure hope to see uh, many of you around in workshops or the networking event tonight. Uh, that's it. Uh, enjoy these upcoming two days of the Best for Ultra Summit. And goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye.
Hello and welcome back to the first keynote of the blog about the future uh, of work. Today with us we have Olivier. Olivier oversees the private sector engagement with the World Economic Forum strategic intelligence practice. His background is focused on the intersection between the private and the public sectors. He develops tools and frameworks to help leaders make sense of complexity and shape the future of their organizations. He previously worked with the Organization for Co Economic Cooperation and Development. Today, um, Olivier will present part of the work uh, of the World Economic Forum, uh, the work they are doing to help people just like you navigate uncertainty by mobilizing expert networks, machine intelligence, and system thinking. So, Olivier, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Walid. Um, thank you very much to, to the organizers for uh, having us uh, uh, today. Um, um, today, what I'd like to do is use the next, uh, let's say, 15, 20 minutes to show you how at the World Economic Forum we are building on networks, on machine intelligence, and on system thinking to help individuals such as yourself and organizations navigate uncertainty. Um, so given the format that, uh, you know, virtual format and the numbers of people that might be uh, watching this, I will be using an uh, online poll to have you feed into this presentation with your thoughts. So thank you in advance for this. Uh, you can see here uh, the details. It will come back uh, when I will need your thoughts uh, later on in the presentation, but just uh, be ready um, to share some uh, inputs uh, into, that, uh, into this conversation. So I'd like to start this uh, with a quote uh, from uh, John Hegel. Um, which uh, some of you might be familiar with, um, who was trying to make sense of um, how change takes place uh, in the economy. Um, and what he observes is a pattern, as a pattern is that the edge transforms uh, the core. Uh, what this means is that change, disruption, usually comes from the edge, comes from uh, external pressure. And we have seen that this can happen rather quickly. Change disruption, of course, uh, it doesn't have to be something negative, but it, it will most likely be if we're not prepared or if we don't see it uh, coming um, in a way. Uh, and I think COVID-19 might probably be one of the most serious, serious and, and best example um, of that. Um, for most of us, uh, actually, epidemics, pandemics have been at best at the edge of our work. Uh, not looking at this you know, very seriously or as part of the core of what we do. And this is in a way understandable. Um, there's only so much uh, we can keep an eye on. There's only so much we can keep track of. But, but the issue here, I, I think, is that you know, if you look at the way the world works and remember what Hegel just, uh, just said, and also if we look at you know, the way we are trained, wired, or simply of our capabilities and limitations as individuals, uh, it makes us somewhat vulnerable and unprepared to, to navigate uh, such a world. And I think here is, is that kind of gap between how the world works and also our capabilities as individuals to make sense of it that we are trying to bridge uh, with, with the work that I will be uh, introducing today uh, here. But I also wanted to say that uh, there is also a bright side of it. It's not just a gap and limitations and struggle and challenge. Um, and if we look at uh, a, a, a quote here I, I put up on the screen in the next couple of seconds, um, Harari uh, was looking uh, uh, as a society uh, at our ability to collaborate in ex extremely flexible ways and with countless numbers of strangers. Uh, and this is what, according to him, enabled us in a way to develop an advantage over other species. So of course, in a way, we have found a very smart ways as a, as a species to kind of overcome that gap or the, that limitation I was mentioning before. And as an organization, uh, the, the World Economic Forum, in a way, you could say that uh, we have been in the business uh, of, of, of uh, creating opportunities for those flexible collaborations uh, for 50 years. Uh, building networks, building communities of individuals, of organizations across stakeholder group, whether we're looking at business, public, private sector, public sector, academia, and other, other groups. And we've done this uh, recurrently for 50 years across stakeholder groups, uh, across different regions of the world, and providing those groups with a platform for discussion, for exchange, uh, for publishing, and also for running projects and initiatives. Um, either, you know, trying to, as a group, make sense of the world or discussing um, the way forward. So that's really uh, something in a way that uh, as, as a bit of an introduction and to, to give you a bit more context for, for the work I will be sharing uh, uh, in the next couple of minutes. 
And even when uh, we look at uh, COVID-19, as we said before, for most of us, it wasn't really at the core of what we do and at the core of what we look at. We had, because of this extensive networks and communities that uh, we work with at the World Economic Forum, we actually have had groups of individuals and organizations who have been focusing on this uh, as their core for many years. And just here, you see a bit of a glimpse uh, of what they've been doing with us uh, over the next uh, decade, uh, the, the, the last decade uh, or so. Uh, Global Risk Report uh, since 2007 has uh, many years actually uh, ranked uh, pandemics as one of the most impactful risk that we should be looking at uh, 2007 following years. We have established uh, in 20, uh, 2010 a group uh, of experts from again across private sector, public sector, academia, uh, on uh, a group that was looking at pandemics uh, and who like the key takeaway of their work was to say that we should actually expect another pandemic as severe as the one we've seen in, in 1918, 1919. Uh, and the whole uh, agenda of that group was really to push the world to learn from most, the most recent experiences with uh, H1N1, for instance. Later on, uh, the launch of CEPI, collaboration between Norway, government of India, Wellcome Trust, the Gates Foundation, the World Economic Forum, uh, to stimulate and accelerate development of a vaccine and also enable access uh, to those vaccines during uh, outbreaks. Followed by a live simulation exercise with leaders from public and private sector, uh, based on a scenario that actually in hindsight was very similar to COVID-19. And this was just uh, in October last year. And all of this now fitting into a wider effort that we call the COVID Action Platform. So, so the question here is to say, you know, the, the, the strength we have as an organization is that these historical uh, and large scale networks of individuals that are specialized in a way in many different fields and kind of living and breathing those issues uh, on a daily basis. So the question for her, for us was, you know, how can we build on this? How can we aggregate that intelligence, all this work, organize it in a way that enables people to work with, with it and, and to make it available uh, to, to a broad, a broad uh, array of, of people. And our approach here um, is very simple. Uh, so what we've done is, of course, is building on, on uh, digital platform capabilities. Um, and what we've done is twofold. First is building on that human intelligence that I just mentioned before, those wide networks of experts uh, and leaders that work on those different issues. And then also enhance this with a layer of what we call machine intelligence, developing an algorithm here uh, that allow us to scan through currently about 250 sources that we have curated, vetted as providing high quality relevant content on all of the issues that we cover in the platform. Uh, this uh, currently brings about 1,000 articles and reports uh, on a daily basis into the platform and allocates this to the relevant uh, areas of work that we have here. All of this um, feeding into what we call transformation map, which is uh, a dynamic uh, visual framework that basically does uh, two very simple things. Um, the first one is really uh, prioritize what is at the core for all of those issues, and also, uh, most importantly, highlight what is uh, of relevance and interest at the edge of those uh, different issues. All of this with this uh, objective uh, to really augment uh, contextual awareness and help people uh, kind of uh, help feed insights into long-term, future-oriented strategic conversations um, and help those to, to take place, building on uh, the best uh, kind of relevant knowledge articulated in a way that reflects both the, the complexity of the world, but also allows the people to digest and make sense of it. Um, so I will uh, take the example of uh, COVID-19 uh, to give you an example of uh, some of those uh, capabilities um, and, and what you will be able to find uh, in this platform. I want to articulate the next couple of minutes around three uh, different questions. Uh, three different things that you could do uh, in the context of, uh, you know, projecting like yourself being interested in COVID-19 and trying to, to make sense of it. The first one here is, uh, how do you make sense? Actually, the first question I think is, how do you make sense of the current crisis? What do we look at? What does it mean? The second question, and now I think we're very quickly moving into this uh, as societies, especially in Europe right now, is really trying to understand and figure out, you know, what will the post-COVID world, the post-immediate crisis look like? And the third one, I think, which is also quite core to the DNA of who we are as an organization, is try to also open 
um, kind of opportunities for people to think about their role in this. So it's not only about building preparedness and trying to anticipate what happens and what will happen, but also try to think about what, what do we want as a society and, and what can we do in a way to, to shape this. So the first question here really is, is about uh, the making sense um, of, the, of the current crisis. Um, and here I will just uh, now shift into the platform itself to give you a bit of a glimpse uh, of, of what, this, what this looks like and, and how you could uh, get some of those uh, information in it. Uh, so what I do here is just uh, open. I see it takes a little bit of time for you to sit. Uh, so I'll just paste myself here. Uh, see the platform, how it looks like. And, and here, the first thing you see is this uh, transformation map, that visual uh, framework uh, on COVID-19. So trying to make sense of the current crisis, what you find here is really what are some of the core issues that are really core to COVID-19. So anyone trying to figure out what is happening right now should probably at least consider those issues. And here it could be, you know, from, you know, what we do to avoid infection of, and spread, the whole quest to find a vaccine uh, to deal with, uh, with the outbreak and with this uh, virus. Also thinking about um, the role of media and information uh, in the context of, of a health crisis like this one. Uh, questions around recovery and response and also different types of implications, whether we're looking at uh, the impact uh, of the outbreak on trade, the impact uh, on travel, financial market, or uh, the workforce. So really this is the starting point. And for each of those areas, I think the, the objective here is that you will find a very quickly uh, sort of 360 view on that topic of COVID-19 and short executive summaries really laying out uh, what this is about. For uh, if we take the example of workforce uh, and the impact uh, of COVID-19 on workforce, you will also have the possibility to further dig, dig in into a related content that is brought to you through this machine intelligence layer as was mentioning before. So some of the latest research um, and analysis here are from some of those 250 content partners that we have vetted uh, that brings you more depth and granularity about the impact of COVID-19 on, on workforce. Also uh, some video content uh, also to allow you to dig uh, further there, uh, data sets, uh, events, initiatives, and also some of the key stakeholders who are uh, either experts on those issues or are shaping those issues um, in a way. So now, Another thing I mentioned at the beginning that is quite core to our approach is not only to give you that 360 overview of a specific issue, but also help you think about this in context and in a more systemic way. And here, going back to Hegel, the second point that was important is to say what some of the factors at the edge or the broader development will also be taken into account if we're trying to understand the current crisis. And here, if we look at the workforce impact uh, of uh, COVID, we might be interested in exploring some of those contextual elements um, that you would see here connected to, to, to the visualization. And I could actually dive into the more general trends and developments around uh, workforce and employment. And here I would find, for instance, one aspect that seems of interest to me in this thinking or conversation I'm having about the impact of COVID-19 on workforce would be that this is taking place against the backdrop of the new work model. And basically here what you see is that uh, most of the newly created jobs are temporary, part-time, independent, and that we don't really have good official data to reflect this. So what does this mean in a context like a pandemic, as we've seen the last couple of months, uh, probably very important to have that backdrop of the new work models in mind where we're trying to understand the, the question of COVID-19 and its impact on workforce. Also here, very important, probably uh, bring into the equation in the conversation, the question of social protection. So different type of safety nets here, different types of approaches, uh, depending on the regions and country, and how does that impact this question of the implication of COVID-19 on workforce? So that's really, uh, in a nutshell, uh, for this first uh, element I wanted to, to look at, um, really get this 360 view quite quickly on the current situation and help you make sense of quite a complex issue in a quite efficient way, building on this aggregation of knowledge and insights from these wide networks we, we are uh, working with. I wanted to now uh, move to the, the second questions I had, the second question I had, uh, which is uh, about this uh, post-COVID world um, and how will this uh, look like in a way? 
And here, what I wanted to do uh, is to actually ask you the first question uh, with regard to this. So I'll quickly share here uh, on my screen uh, the information about the Slido poll. You might be familiar with this. Uh, very simply, uh, you will see appearing in a couple of seconds here a QR code, or you could also just join us uh, by typing slido.com in your browser and then hashtag WEF, and you will uh, directly uh, access the, the poll here. So the first question I wanted to ask you, when we're trying to think about that post-COVID world, um, the first question I have is, how do you think uh, it might look like? And here I just put a few options on the table, basically in the continuum between, you know, everything will be uh, back to normal, uh, with uh, it will be mostly back to normal, somewhat different or significantly uh, different. So I would just like you to, um, you see still the QR code, uh, from your phone, you can scan this and uh, directly get to the poll, or you could uh, join uh, through slido.com uh, hashtag uh, WEF and let us know uh, how do you think this post COVID world might, might look like. So I'll just pause here for, for a few seconds, let you uh, take this uh, and let me know what, uh, what your thoughts are. Thanks. So the results are coming in. I'll just Keep it open for a few more seconds. Fantastic, uh, perfect. So I'll let uh, some, uh, you know, if you're on your way to the poll, I'll let you, you finish this, we'll still capture that. But uh, what I think is, is interesting here, and, and I would say my conclusion, and I've run this several times in different contexts in the last couple of weeks, um, and I think what's interesting is that actually no one really knows, right? Uh, some of you think it will be significantly different, somewhat different, mostly back to normal, somewhat spread across those, those three uh, and still changing, but very actually not really clear, clear cut. Uh, so the point I'm trying to make here is that we actually don't really know. This is an unfolding story. We're still pretty much uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in this situation, looking at how things unfold. And basically, if we're trying to think about what comes after the immediate crisis, uh, I think what the proposition I would put on the table is that uh, we cannot really predict it. We need to try to monitor its evolution. Um, and that's kind of the only way we can increase our preparedness to, to what will come. So I think here, um, uh, predicting is a bit of a pointless game. No one really knows this is unprecedented and we're still quite in the middle of this. Um, so as a next step, I'd like to move into that conversation on those premises um, and try to get a sense. So for those who are on the, on the poll, please stay there. Uh, try to have you help me uh, prioritize uh, what would be some of the key drivers, some of the key areas that will have the highest impact in shaping that post-COVID world. So again, we don't know how it will look like. The best thing we can do now is try to figure out what are the drivers of that new normal and start monitoring how they will um, evolve over time. So here what I've done is that I have uh, compiled uh, 10 different dimensions that uh, have been shared with us uh, again uh, by, uh, and prioritized by uh, different groups of individuals uh, with whom we had uh, similar conversations the last couple of weeks. Um, and here uh, put uh, some of the top 10 of those issues. I'd like for you to take a moment to go through that and let us know which one you know, pick one, two, or three that you think will be most critical in shaping the post-COVID world. So, you know, the ability for us to trust the media and online content and the ability to assign accountability for its accuracy. Is it something, you know, we don't really know in what direction it will go. Is it something that will, um, you would prioritize as key for, for the future and helping us find out how the, the post-COVID world would look like? This question around work models, the extent to which organization will actually shift and successfully uh, achieve digital transformation, um, new patterns of consumption, the question around travel, security, and mobility, about the global value chains and their potential restructuring, economic shifts, trust in government and institutions, uh, the right balance between taxes and spending, and how we preserve uh, social protections, and also technologies for COVID-19 and the potential and the type of rules that, and shared rules that we will uh, establish around things like contracts, uh, contact tracing and other potentially invasive uh, digital tools. Good. 
So I'll just take here a uh, note of uh, what you have uh, prioritized uh, on the spot and show you the type of uh, things that uh, we think uh, you could do also with this uh, uh, shared resource we've put together. So we have digital transformation of organization, restructuring of global value chains, trust and accountability, and uh, let's see, patterns of consumption and travel security. So I'll just prioritize this. This is probably worth a longer conversation. It's a bit of a, just an, an example here I want to, to make. So patterns, consumption and travel and security. So I will uh, thank you for, for this. I'll stop the poll for now. It's good we had a, a bunch of responses. Thank you for that. Uh, what I wanna do now is, is shift and go back to, to the platform and show you how we are uh, also uh, through that uh, approach uh, helping people monitor uh, fluid and evolving uh, situations and make sense of what could happen. So what I've done here is a little bit of uh, preparatory work. So you can see here on your screen, I've already built uh, uh, from a blank canvas, uh, the best virtual summit post COVID world where I brought all of those uh, 10 different issues. Uh, and here I will just remove those that you have not uh, prioritized for now. It's a uh, dynamic. This is something you can really build in all of the different dimensions we have in the system. Um, and here this and good. So I think here I have the one, two, three, four, five, six uh, different aspect that you have uh, prioritized. And this is something I can uh, very quickly here save and in a way make part of my um, personal library. So this is now fully uh, embedded into the, the wider ecosystem. Uh, and here, uh, something you can uh, now monitor. It will allow you still to identify the links with the broader context and what's happening at the edge and also give you the late, latest research and analysis on those uh, different topics. Uh, so I think that's again, uh, how we wanted to uh, also show how we are mobilizing those tools uh, to help people figure out uh, very fluid and uncertain futures and try to build some, some degrees of preparedness by identifying what could be some of the drivers there of that future and then uh, basically monitor uh, their evolution. I'll uh, move back to, to this. Uh, the third question I had, and here we'll go uh, quite quickly through it, mindful of the time. Uh, as I said, we just don't want to help people prepare for, for what's coming, but we're also interested in putting them into the driving seat and trying to take ownership of that. And I think a key question we are um, asking ourselves uh, at the forum and we are uh, starting a new initiative around that is really um, around what can we do and how do we want that post COVID world um, to look like in a way. So I think here, basically the COVID-19 uh, you know, lockdown, is now gradually easing, but anxiety about the world's social and economic prospect is only intensifying in a way. And the damage, it's very clear, has been very serious, both in terms of lives taken and livelihood lost. Um, but we also see that there is some sort of windows of opportunity for us and for us as a society to rethink uh, the, the whole model and reset you know, how our society works, economy works and institutions. Uh, and here, basically, I think the two takeaways is that the crisis in a way have magnified uh, most of the dysfunctionality of our current model, you know, making inequalities more salient, Ill illustrating also what can happen when healthcare systems or so social safety nets are neglected. And the crisis also has opened up a new field of possibilities in a way. I think it's fair to say that for most of us, you know, we thought we would never see or live uh, what we lived and saw in the last few months. Um, and I think this is really that opportunity now uh, where we have seen what is wrong. We also have seen that a lot of uh, new possibilities are open um, and the question of uh, kind of uh, build on that momentum and take that opportunity to, to, to think and contribute uh, to, to what this new world could look like and not just uh, kind of be passive about it and think um, about uh, you know, how we prepare for whatever comes. Uh, so here, the only message is that also in terms of the platform, we've also built on that collective uh, intelligence here um, and brought in a uh, few priorities that are being shared with us by these extensive networks uh, so that it could become in a way, a bit of a framework if you are interested in that question for you to think about that uh, from you know how we are harnessing some of the emerging technologies and the type of governance we want to put uh, around that in this new world. Uh, from the, the, the form and shape of the economic recovery 
rethinking and redesigning social contracts? How do we think about new business models in, in, in this post-COVID world, et cetera? Um, so here is, is basically what I wanted to share with you today. Uh, really, um, those three uh, questions really from the, showing you how we are mobilizing those networks, amplifying this with ma machine intelligence um, and, and putting it, uh, looking at this through the lens of system thinking um, and how in a case like COVID-19, this could be a resource for you to help you decode and make sense what's happening right now, monitor and prepare for the future and also shape and influence in a way uh, the world to come. And as a last uh, note, I wanted to say that here, it was all kind of uh, structured around COVID-19. Uh, all of this, uh, we are actually doing for more than 250 areas. So you will find in the system, similar approach, you know, uh, uh, including 150 countries and regions, 80 global issues and, and 20 industries. Uh, and here, just to close, I want to share uh, uh, here, uh, kind of the basic information for you to access that resource in case this is of interest. Uh, you know, as per the mission of our organization, uh, the content and, and the knowledge is public. Um, so that's something that you can all access uh, through just signing up to the platform uh, and then getting lost into that web and ecosystem of issues and hopefully use this to inform some of your uh, conversation and, and help you figure out uh, some of that uncertainty and complexity that uh, surrounds you, uh, depending on whichever issue you're looking or working on. Um, so I think I'll just pause here. I'm a bit over time, uh, but thank you very much for your attention. I hope that that was useful and, and I hope you will find interesting information in, in, in that platform. Thank you very much, uh, Olivier. Um, I am one of the people who are registered to the intelligence uh, platform website and I definitely follow it and I encourage everyone to follow it for, you know, how uh, insights, strategic insight it gives. We have a lot of questions, but we don't have time for all of them. So I will pick uh, just a couple of them. Uh, you mentioned in your presentation that uh, you want to help people take ownership of the future and be part of the Great Reset, which is something that we are trying to do with this summit uh, with young people. So what do you think are some of the strategic conversations that young people should be having right now or should have in the near future? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think first I would start with the fact that uh, the young people, it sounds a bit cliche, but I think it's nevertheless the reality and quite important is that uh, the young generation are those that will be, uh, you know, the adults and, and kind of living uh, what will, whatever we do now uh, in the next uh, 10 or, or 20 years. Um, so I think it's actually very important that we include them um, in those conversations that they are actively shaping this. Um, I think there's many, many, uh, and also if I think about uh, what we do as an organization, uh, really in, I think first, you know, we, we take this very seriously and we have actually wide networks of, of young people. We call them the global shapers. So people with less than 30 years old organizing different hubs all across the world really to bring them into those conversations. In terms of what is important, uh, we are actually covering a, a lot of different grounds. I think the current, I would actually answer kind of looking at what I was just sharing about that great reset. I think that this crisis has been unprecedented. Uh, we might just be at the beginning of it. It's been showing us both what doesn't work and also uh, show us that something we would have never expected can happen. And I think here are some of the key issues uh, that we see is everything around social contract, uh, work, uh, social protection, how people contribute and are supported in the society. Um, and then another one that I think is cutting through uh, is the, 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 the climate and environmental uh, impact of whatever we do as a society. So I think for me, those two things are quite high on the agenda. Um, and then you would see if you, if you refer back to what I was closing uh, with, there's also the whole question uh, for me that is really important. Uh, and I think the young generation are quite key there because they are probably the most uh, tech savvy in that sense. It's really figuring out how do we want to leverage uh, all of those emerging technologies. And I think most of these are open conversations and we can see the type of impact they have on society. So I would say this is kind of the third one uh, where I think I would say is, is one of the priorities really. And everything is to be made there because there's uh, so much that is still unclear and undecided. So really kind of design and develop the governance and the regulation around those technologies and make sure we build that in a way that um, you know have those technologies create the world that we want to be in in the future um, so i think that's that's the three areas i would point out 
Absolutely. In best, we are believers of the role of young people in shaping their own future. And we hope that your presentation today uh, helped give some insights to the young people on where they can start and what conversation they can uh, have. Thank you very much, Olivier. I wish we had more time to tackle uh, more questions. Um, definitely, I urge everyone to check uh, the intelligence.weforum.com uh, uh, website. Um, right now, we are having next uh, a presentation from Hanno Brumer, the global head of pro uh, production and technology at Covestro. Uh, he will be sharing with us how it, does it look like uh, during the pandemic and beyond uh, at Covestro. So stay tuned and see you in a couple of minutes. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this for the second keynote of today. The COVID-19 pandemic has changed the world significantly. Being part of the essential chemical network, most productions were kept running while limiting people in the sites to the most critical personnel. Many employees of, uh, of, of the companies have moved to work from home. At the same time, customer industries as well as supply chains globally have been affected by the economic situation due to the pandemic. Today, we have the honor to hear from Mr. Hanno Brumer from Covestro on the second keynote of the day. Covestro is a chemical materials manufacturer producing mainly polyurethanes and polycarbonates for a variety of industries, such as transportation, construction, and electronics. Mr. Brumer is the current senior vice president as the global head of production and technology, the business unit polyurethanes being responsible for more than 15 production sites across the globe, several thousand employees, and an integrated asset base for the production of MDI, TDI, and polyethers. 
Mr. Bruma is also a member of the Industrial Advisory Board of EIIL, European Institute for Industrial Leadership, Developing Talent for the Industry. He will tell us today about Covestro having launched its new company vision on becoming fully circular, which sets a clear path moving towards, towards and, and shows a long-term strategic program embracing circular economy guides through cyclicality. Thank you for joining us today, Mr. Brumer, and the floor is, is yours now. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Walid, uh, and welcome everybody uh, to my presentation. Uh, I'm very happy uh, to have been invited uh, for this presentation today. So uh, uh, I'd like to share with you uh, some thoughts about what does it mean uh, working in and beyond the pandemic uh, at Covestro. Uh, as mentioned, I'm globally responsible for a large production network. Uh, sorry, I want to ask you to share again the, the presentation. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. Yes, yes it's perfect. Can you see it now? Okay, sorry yes. about that. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, so, um, as I said, I'm responsible for the global production network of the so-called polyurethanes. Uh, and of course, uh, we have seen a very strong effect, both from the pandemic, but also, of course, the consequences on the economics uh, due to, uh, to COVID-19. Uh, if you're interested, uh, also beyond uh, what a production head globally does, uh, here you see my uh, credentials. So just visit my Instagram uh, page and then you will see also what else is going on in the world. So today, uh, uh, I want to share again a little bit about the situation. Covestro is a global manufacturer's company of materials, materials for the polymers market, raw materials for poly polyurethanes and polycarbonates. These are materials which are all over your daily life. Uh, and I will give you some examples uh, in a second. Just to give an idea what kind of company we are, you see, uh, we have roughly 12 billion sales. Uh, we are, as you see, in all the regions. Our headquarter is in Germany. Our origin is also German, but you see also from the sales spread that we have a global reach uh, across uh, the major regions. Um, as a production companies, we are operating uh, production sites around the world. Our major sites are in the middle of Germany, uh, in North Rhine-Westphalia, where we have three sites, one in the north. We have also major hubs near Houston uh, in Baytown and near Shanghai in Sao Jin, and smaller sites uh, in many other areas, including Mexico, Japan, Thailand, Spain, Antwerp, uh, mid and larger sites. And we serve multiple industries, as I mentioned. This is not just only one product for one industry, our materials or raw materials are then made into, first of all, foams, uh, either three-dimensional foams that you know from insulation, that you know from furniture, soft or hard foams, or into clear plastics, wherever you see clear plastics, or into coatings. And therefore, we serve all the industries that you see, whether it's transportation from auto cars or rail cars into the construction because of insulation, of course, into the furniture market for soft foam, uh, and cushions, but also the so-called clear plastic on your iPhone, uh, the screen on your TV, uh, window shields uh, made out of clear plastics up to stadium roofs are made from polycarbonates. Uh, and many, many other inclu uh, applications, including very special ones like in medical, uh, which of course uh, even uh, lately have had increased uh, demand. So what does it mean for a company like this uh, the, the current situation. There, there, we always speak about the lockdown and we have to look at the lockdown from two angles. First of all, of course, our customers, the final consumers are being locked down. Who is locked down will not go out and will not go be shopping. Also due to the uncertainty, uh, people might not be uh, wanna go shopping. Uh, even the, dis uh, the discussion about if we could still produce cars, would people now buy cars and invest a lot of money with a lot of uncertainties? But secondly, also the industry producing this have been locked down due to the situation. 
We don't produce the final product. We make the chemical raw material and then a producer makes the foam that goes, for instance, uh, into a furniture. And you've seen that car industry, furniture industry, apparel industry have been completely shut down due to the situation. So the entire world, and that's also different, let's say versus a 2008, where a financial, let's say restriction or a financial constraint happened, it was formally really a full lockdown. But it also means that everything around moving, so things to be moved uh, and people to be moved and goods to be moved were very restricted up to lockdown. And we saw that in the chemical industry very widely when the entire supply chain, which is a highly complex structure, was suffering directly, for instance, when the pandemic started in China, that from rail cars, from truck drivers, all of the, this entire system could not happen anymore. And then, of course, the entire system goes into uh, a lockdown. At the same time, uh, and we should keep that in mind, we hear that governments are very active. Governments are supporting the situation very strongly in the sense of supports, funds, uh, all kinds of aids, which are at, I don't know how you see it, at quite some uh, astronomical numbers here and there, uh, hoping that we can recover the economy. But of course, the big question remains, what does it mean for the future? Because we haven't seen a situation like this uh, in our history. Secondly, and that was also a very important learning, when you look at the lockdown of the supply chain, uh, the societies realized, we all talk about always that the energy network is crucial. Uh, and we all know what it would mean if electricity in a continent would fail for more than a week. On the other hand, many people were not so aware that also the base chemical network is a very critical network keeping a lot of things running without being, let's say, directly seen. I give you an example. We are producing caustic soda. We are also producing hydrochloric acid. That's a versatile chemical which goes into many, many applications from household cleaning, from disinfections, many plastics, cleaning water, steel industry, all these uh, basic, basic chemicals. Uh, and if that network, either due to the supply chain or to the production, cannot be maintained, we have serious effects. And that's why also very quickly it was realized how crucial it is to keep also the base chemical industry running to keep the network and not make the situation more difficult than it is already. We're talking in this situation, of course, about uncertainty and planning horizon. And everybody says already, yes, uh, also 2020 without Corona would have been a typical year. We are in the face of uncertainties. We talk about it, uncertainties in financial markets. We talk about long-term planning, uh, about ecosystems. But of course, the current pandemic has really forced that situation to an even more critical point. Uncertainty levels have really risen. Who can really predict what and when things will happen, when things will be recovered? And certainly also, what does it mean? Will they recover just to where they were or will they recover to the so-called new normal? And uh, if you spare the time uh, and go into the internet, you will pretty much find any scenarios that you can think of. And anybody has no crystal ball because again, there's so much uncertainty. What will it be? Will the world in five years be the same? Or will it, like we've experienced it in the banking sector, be very, very different? And some industries we know, like the airline, like the travel, like personal behaviors, they might change forever. We might look back in so many years or our children might look back saying, yes, 2020 has changed the way we travel has changed the way we interact. We will find out, but certainly uncertainty will remain. And what does it mean for just working and also working in Covestro, but of course in other companies? As I mentioned, we kept essential production running. What does it mean? In our production plans, they are the production people themselves. They are people who are crucial to keeping production running, like the maintenance, like the quality labs, uh, the safety departments, all those people were kept working under very, very strict conditions. So from temperature controls at the gates, uh, wearing masks uh, all the time, 
having shift reliefs between groups without meeting each other. So like we do now virtually on video. So making sure if there was an infection, you would maybe affect one group of six to eight to 10 people, but not the entire site, again, to keeping things running. A very difficult situation. And I must say, I have high respect for the people who keep everything running, who work under these very strict, difficult situation on top of what that all means for their families. We have other uh, areas like laboratories, which are essential, which cannot be uh, work from home, but have to be worked in the plant. And those were essentially shut down. That the development work can wait. Yes, it's not for day-to-day -day production. On the other hand, if you lose a year of development, you use a year of development. So in the end, this will all be things that have also experienced a pause and would have to catch up. And then of course, there's the big topic of working from home. Uh, even for me, uh, in my job, you can uh, imagine I have a lot of travel to do uh, and I have been pretty much working in my home office the last uh, 14 weeks or so. A very big difference, but again, compared to the production personnel, to the people in the plants, uh, I would say a rather easier change. On the other hand, we see there's in all these difficulties, in all that situation, there have been some very nice positive developments like we do today. Digital tools have really emerged. So who was ready for digital, who had a good base, who had the good knowledge, their things really developed. This is from everything we used before, like chats or video meetings, but they have really fostered. Big meetings are pretty much now happening online. And to be honest, is it not even easier to attend an online meeting versus to travel around the world? Not even talking about the CO2 footprint, not talking about the cost, but also contracts. Systems are available, so you can sign legally binding contracts electronically. Not everywhere uh, the legal situation allows that still, but many, many are. And a lot of things in a company like us needs approval, approval for some financial or any kind of things. This has been all moved, of course, to electronic and doesn't need people running around uh, for a signature anymore. So when you look at nature, when you look at our environment, it has certainly benefited. The carbon footprint also of the Covestro people has definitely decreased. And some people even speak about, we have gained flexibility. I spoke to people saying, working at home means for me, I can actually take a run at 2 p.m. in the afternoon uh, and then have the meetings to 7 p.m. I don't have to take a second pair of closings to work. So for me, that's flexibility. I don't spend time in the subway in the morning or in the car uh, in the rush hour. But let's not forget, not everybody has the same situation. Not everybody is as fortunate uh, as, as we are having an own home office, people trying to be in small family settings. This time has been very, very difficult and uh, needed a lot of constraints and uh, also put, put stress on people. And last but not least, one of also the work I'm doing a whole lot is on personnel, working with people, developing people. And I must say, Yes, the technique, the digital technique has advanced, but to have a face-to-face -face meeting on personal interaction uh, is hard to exchange. In that time, we also have launched our new company vision, which is that Covestro will fully embrace circular economy. And I wanna just very briefly give you an idea what this is about. On our long-term sustainability strategy, uh, we decided as Covestro, to embrace this as a long-term strategic program by use alternative raw materials. Carbon is essential for the polymer industry and will most likely remain essential, but we cannot afford just take carbon out of the ground, making polymers, and later on when they are wasted or incinerated, they produce CO2. We need to bring the carbon back. And we have shown that we can bring the carbon back in the form of CO2 into matrices we will be looking very much deeper into recycling. So taking materials and bringing them back and making new materials out of them. This of course can all be done with joint solution. That means maybe a polyurethane player can also use a polymer from a different industry uh, as their raw material. It's not only everybody for him or herself, but it's also about creating networks, creating joint solutions across the industry. And last but not least, of course, energy that we use needs also to be based on renewable, so having a positive CO2 
balance. And we like to paint that picture uh, that I show here, saying on the left side, you see depicted a tree. This is how nature does it. Nature produces carbon products. They deteriorate, but in the end, it's able to recycle them, the carbon, either through the air or to the soil uh, into new carbon. It's not like that a leaf becomes a leaf, but the carbon stays in the cycle. And that's exactly also our philosophy to saying we can use the end products and bring them back either through energy, either to breaking them up in, uh, in other plastics or even breaking them down to raw materials or so-called small molecules and then bring them back into the value chain. If we can close that cycle, we will have really what we target as a company to reduce our impact on the environment. So now you ask yourself, is that maybe not a bad timing in the middle of a storm launch a new vision? But actually we feel like timing is of the essence and we are determined to have this vision for a long-term plan and even, or you could say, although we have a situation like this, it is even more important not to change the plan because a long-term vision is a long-term plan that you wanna pursue. This is not about one, two, three years, but this is what should guide you. Uh, and probably even let's say the bigger the storm is, the better is that you know your long-term goal. So to summarize that, what does working uh, for us mean? And uh, sorry, due to the time, I could only cover a few aspects, but we are developing into new normal. Of course, just as the virus moves from east to west, it's also moving from east to west that also our plants, our production comes into a new normal. We see a very strong focus on digital tools and that will definitely continue. I talked about the financial burden where we will all see it. We will see it, the next generation will see it. What does it all mean? All the decisions being taken in 2020 and the sustainability debate has a new momentum. And again, we feel this is really crucial. We should not be tempted by saying energy is so cheap. We should leave the path of renewable energy right now. It is very important if societies, economies recover we really do it the way we should be doing is, and this is fully circular, fully sustainable. And that's why we feel our company vision fits right also in these difficult times. Thank you very much for your attention. This was an overview. And as I understand, uh, I'm happy to take now questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Brumer, for the very interesting talk and for, uh, and for explaining us so um, with the time you had. Um, we have some questions from the audience or, or already. I'd like, sure. to, I'd like to ask you, um, the first question is, from your perspective, what was the most difficult measure to implement in Covestro's working methods during this pandemic? Most difficult. Um, again, to implement the measures is one thing. Uh, we were very determined. We very quickly shut down our plans and limited to, as I said, to the most essential people. The most difficult, and I've talked with people, I've dialed into control rooms, into maintenance shop. The most difficult for the people was really to making this happen. Just imagine a maintenance work where you work together on an apparatus in a plant. It's not easy to keep 1.5 meter distance or working with a, with a mask uh, in that situation where it's also uh, body constraint. And that's why I said, we are very determined to have those measures in place but it would it put extra strain and extra effort on the people to realize them every day. But in the end, it has paid off. The numbers in Covestro are very, very low uh, on infections. So we feel like we did the right choice to be as consequential as we were. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, another, another question is regarding CO2 emissions and renewables, how does Covestro help Germany towards reaching the goals of the Paris Agreement and the newly published long-term strategic plan for climate change from the UN and also regarding the, the European Green Deal. Yes, we feel that our vision is fully aligned because when you look at the vision about the so-called Green Deal or becoming fully circular in our long-term vision where we have, let's say, renewable energy from wind and we've just signed last year one of the biggest contracts uh, with a wind manufacturer, then using renewable uh, electricity, making products uh, 
that in the end we can take out and bring them back on recycle, either recycle the CO2 or recycle uh, the polymer chemically, in the end we will have a net zero emission on CO2. So we are fully aligned with what uh, also European and other states are targeting to keep, let's say, to get the CO2 back in balance. And that's, that's a crucial thing. It's, we have to keep it back in balance. Right now, we are not in balance. When you, when you say in the end, um, what do you mean by end? You mean a particular year? Uh, particular it's a long-term vision. You cannot nail it down to say, okay, this is a five-year plan. It's a long-term vision. You know that, for instance, the European Union has put up the 2050 goal. So you, this all talks about nobody knows exactly will it be 2050 exactly uh, or plus minus. I think it's important. You have to start now. You think 30 years is a long time, but on the other hand, we know how long developments take, how long chemical processes, let's say if you want to make now polyurethanes fully out of recycled materials, these are processes that have to go to from the lab scale to the pilot scale. This will take several, several years. So we said 30 years sounds long, but actually it's not long if you look at to process development. We need to start now to have a long-term plan and to be successful. Thank you. Um, your opinion on giving people flexibility on choosing their place of work, is that something that we can expect to continue in the future, even after we are back to a second normal? Uh, you talk about choosing the place, meaning home office or office. Yes, also these things uh, will definitely continue. We already spoke about uh, that even if we are limiting, let's say, the pandemic level to one lower, uh, so bringing more and more people, let's say also the process development people in the plant, uh, we're still asking people who can work from home, they should work from home. So I expect that for a very long time to continue, there's no reason uh, also for a person like me to drive into the office to have phone calls uh, all day. Uh, I might as well, if, if I can handle, do this from home. And again, we have established many of these things. So yes. Uh, I think some things will change also in the long run. Thank you. And one last question. Um, what is your opinion about the new logistic challenges? Uh, for example, shorter supply chains. How can a chemical company like Covestro cope with the new situation? We have very good, uh, stable, strong supply chains. Of course, we have to cope with the situation. We've seen that, that countries which used to work very closely together, for instance, in Europe have for the time being, for good reasons, shut down their borders. Uh, but we expect those things uh, to work together again. There will be a question, how much will we maybe be shipped around oceans in the future? Maybe some things will get more regional. On the other hand, we believe uh, in the global setup. We already have hubs in the regions. So to be ready for the regions, also for local supply. Uh, and we feel, uh, this will continue. Uh, it's also a matter, again, of balance supply and demand and have a stable supply chain. So means how much you keep in storage and how much flexibility you have the supply chain. Uh, I would expect also areas, I don't know, in Asia or in Europe working even closer together to have one common goal, one common strategy, let's say on, on rail or other long-term sustainable transportation systems. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Rumer, for taking the time to be with us and for uh, and for all the, and for answering all the questions. For 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 our our audience on that side, please don't forget to continue. Our upcoming keynote is entitled "The New Normal of Work," presented by Diogo Mendonça, Operations Director at B Engineering. Thank you all, and see you soon. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, everybody.
Hello everyone. Um, with society continuously changing, uh, the way we work also obviously continuously changes. And in, in this kind of situations, it is always very interesting uh, to have people who are uh, proactively looking into the future and trying to assess where we are going to go towards. This is why we're very happy to today have a keynote um, of Diogo Mendonça, um, who is uh, going to uh, explain us a little bit uh, how the future will look like in the perspective. Uh, Jogo has been working for a company called B Engineering, which is an engineering company which is focused on providing services in energy, chemical, and uh, pharmaceutical and pharmaceutical sectors. Even though the company started only 10 years ago, it has managed to develop and perfect their own methodologies to ensure mutually beneficial collaborations with their, com uh, with their customers. Jogo has been working in, at B Engineering for almost eight years and has the habit of transforming his knowledge in added value for the community, its clients and partners. As the B Engineering Operations Director, he looks to each organization challenge and builds solutions and opportunities. In this keynote, we will travel 10 years into the future and talk about how fast the status quo in the business world changed. Before we start, I would like to remind our viewers that we're all very welcome to post your questions for Diogo in the comments on this stream in YouTube or Facebook. That's it. I will give the floor to you to share with us his thoughts on the new normal of work. Yeah. So hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Sena and Best, and thanks for inviting. Um, I'm going to try to share today in a very brief talk uh, what we believe, me and the team believe to be you know, the new normal of work. It's going to be a very short uh, preview into that. So I'll leave my contact at the end if you want to reach out. I do enjoy to, to be involved in the community, so really do feel free to do so, okay? So I'm gonna share just a quick presentation that we did, uh, which has um, a couple of topics that I wanna share. So, Sena, if you cannot see my screen, do let me know again, okay? Thank you. Um, so you guys, the new normal of work, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna share four uh, topics. Give me one second. Okay, so 10 years and 10 days. Uh, well, we called it like this because, you know, companies all around the world had to push their digital transformation and the adoption of uh, remote workforce, for example, in a very short amount of time. You know, businesses had to, to adapt. Some of them couldn't, which, you know, they're, they're kind of struggling at this time. So we're all just learning as we go as well. So I'm, I'm not going to share with you a very uh, absolute answer uh, for anything. I'm just going to share some ideas because I do believe that, you know, if we all share our solutions, uh, the sum of all of us uh, make them up with a better option. So 10, 10 years and 10 days, how's the job market going to be tomorrow? Is it going to change that much? I, I don't really think so, um, but I do believe it's shifting for the, for the better. So the work methods, of course, uh, it's it's kind of an obvious obvious question, but I want to share it with you. And the work relations, well, will they change that much? So, 
just one quotation that I really, really enjoy that I follow on a personal level and of course on a professional level as well, which is try, it's by Albert Einstein because you know everyone knows Albert Einstein, but try to look at every difficulty as an opportunity. And if you do so, that will change the way that you build your career. Okay. So that has helped me a lot in, in the past years. And I, I truly believe this in this, sorry. Um, so 10 years in 10 days, guys. Um, you know, companies had to, to refocus in a very, very, very short amount of time. We're all doing that at this time. Okay. Um, but, you know, it, it kind of pushed the market forward um, very fast, which is good. You know, it, it is good. Uh, in, in the most majority of situations, it, it's a good thing. So flexible work, it's going to be the new normal. It's not new to us to, to be engineering. I'm in the tech branch of the company. So the company has 10 years, but in technology, we have seven. And I joined the company at the beginning in Portugal and Lisbon. That's where I am at the moment. I, I am Portuguese as well. Um, so um, we, we were born a multinational. So uh, remote work, remote collaboration was, um, was status quo for us. It's, it's how we had to do business. But of course we needed, we needed to, to adapt further at this time. But flexible work is gonna be the new normal. For example, it's gonna be focused on the quality of what you bring much rather than the amount of time that you spend within office walls, which is the fourth line, which means productivity. Uh, we have a saying in Portugal, which is uh, when you have more liberty to do as you please, that brings more res responsibility. So I would say that that's, that's the key factor. It's finding the best approach for each department, for each team inside a company, and bear in mind that it's gonna be flexible from now on. It's, it's not gonna be, I would say nine to five, very strict nine to five work uh, in the future. Um, because you know the, this, this coronavirus pandemic, it kind of awoken uh, the market to, to realize that we needed to adapt. Uh, because you know, unfortunately, this, this might happen again in the future and we need to be ready for that because the market can stop and our lives can stop. So um, remote workforce, it's gonna be a long-term uh, long trend. It's, I, I can give you an example. We do uh, a lot of work, of course, for, for other countries outside Portugal. Uh, I have a particular project in the UK, in London, London-based, um, which we work in, in Lisbon with them as well. And the guys um, that uh, initially uh, came up with the team and me, well, they asked me to do remote work since day one. Um, and I said, okay, not a problem. So we came up with a schedule, you know, we left out Mondays and Fridays because it's, you know, people tend to be more comfortable after and, and, and post weekend. So um, they, they avoided that days, but Tuesday, Wednesdays and Thursdays, they could be remote. And that has worked amazingly well since the first day. So remote workforce, and this is just an example that most, you know, most companies um, we're not that keen into it. Uh, it's going to be the new normal, okay? And the mindset. So I'm. I think I have, you know, kind of talked about the mindset at this time. But this remote mindset, this productivity mindset, is going to be the key factor, in my opinion. Okay. So uh, the job market. How is it going to be tomorrow? Um, just a very short uh, comparison on. on you know, some key topics that the industry is talking about or the job market is talking about. Of course, you used to work on site, you're gonna do remote, um, at least partially, you're gonna do it uh, or are doing it this time. Um, the meetings, well, you know, uh, most companies had the idea that they needed to be face-to-face. -face. Uh, well, guess what? It's not possible at this time, so they're gonna be virtual. You just need uh, the right technology to do so. Um, but that, that's it. But will you be more productive? Will you, um, you know, have less success? I don't think so, uh, because you do have the option to, at some point, uh, pick up the plane or the car, or the train or the bus or whatever, and meet the person face to face, you know, shake his hand, look him into the eyes. So I, I do believe that it's going to be like a mixed, uh, a mixed percentage of uh, meeting persons face to face but mostly it's gonna be virtual. 
Um, and before the office was, you know, the default office. I don't think I need to, to dwell into that. And, and now it's going to be maybe at a conference center or maybe you're going to have, going to have a, a shared office space. You know, um, we at this time, we're about 190 people in Portugal connected to, to tech, to ICT. Um, and we have teams in all, all over the country. And we do have another office in the country. So they're all spread. Um, the office in another city in Porto, which is the second largest city in the country, that, you know, people work there some days, some days they don't, but there's a, this is a shared space as well. So it's going to be, um, it's going to be different, but, you know, if you focus on productivity, it's got not going to affect that much, in my opinion, of course. And I do have some experience working remotely in the past because I, I worked for Microsoft for two years uh, for the U.S. Um, and I worked with all oh, with many different countries at that time. My, it was a, a worldwide position. Uh, so I had to adapt to time schedules in Russia and China and Brazil and Venezuela and so on, and the US, of course. So uh, did it mean that much? Did it affect my work that much? No, it didn't. Um, was I permanently at the Lisbon office? Uh, no, I wasn't. Um, do I felt the need to be there? Yes, I did. And this is, a, of course, a personal opinion, but I do enjoy being with people at the office, you know. Um, and I think that matters, at least at, at some point. So the before, you have commute, uh, which, which is a very good thing. You're not going to have that much commute, which is amazingly good for the environment as well. And let's not forget about it. The business travels were the default. They're not going to be that often. They're, they're not happening at this time, of course. And they will happen less in the future. People will adapt to that. It's going to, it's going to be like the shift of mindset as well, you know, the, that idea that you have to, you know, again, shake the person's hand face to face. It's going to change a lot, but people we, will be more prepared for that. So it's going to be easy, I think. Um, team building events were, you know, were face to face. So at this time or the post pandemic, uh, companies, uh, you know, they realized they could not be that much prepared on a medical and a health and safety um, uh, policies. They're preparing more for that. So that's gonna be a very strong push uh, and focus in the future as well. Uh, I'm not saying that it wasn't. I'm just saying that it's gonna be more tight in a good way. Um, business travels will probably be the, the essential ones, you know, like uh, a closing or a celebration uh, or an important technical discussion. They're not just gonna be to have uh, you know, follow-up or steering meetings. That, that won't make much sense in the future. Um, and of course, you're going to have a lot of team building events online, which uh, I, I, might, I might share with you that we have done, or I can share with you that we have done some. Uh, we always did, by the way. But we have done some more. And, you know, people feel really good about it. And, you know, we're spread across Europe. We, we also have offices in Belgium, um, we're spread across Europe and we have done it, so it, it works really well, okay? So, um, just um, for you guys that might work in the future in one of those big companies, these are some examples of uh, some big, big companies that have shifted completely. So, Amazon, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Spotify, and so on. They, some of them have completely shifted to remote work. So, they're, they're, some of them have closed their permanent, you know, default offices. So this is clearly a sign to everyone that the market is shifting, we're adapting, but it's gonna be okay. You know, it's not, it's not gonna affect how, how companies grow and impact the market. It's just a matter of finding the right methods for the future. Okay, so the work methods, will they evolve? You know, it's, I think we have covered some of this um, but, you know, remote workforce is going to be uh, um, the new default, by the way. Online collaboration is amazingly good. Uh, we have worked, we have used it uh, for quite some time now. Uh, you know, it's like I'm typing an email and someone is correcting my, my uh, phrases and my words as I type. So I have, you know, used that for quite some time. It's, it's, it's really amazing. You, you can't be more productive than that, right? So it's going to be, again, finding the right tech to support this. Um, it's going to be a very much like the mindset that we approached previously. 
very much goal oriented. It's not going to be the amount of time, the amount of tasks. It's going to be, did you make it? Did the quality of your, what you delivered, was it good? That, that's, that's what matters. Um, so they're going to be very much performance driven teams. Um, so do it good, do it right, do it on time rather than just, you know, you have to be at the office, you have to do those meetings. That's, that's going to shift. And I do believe it's shifting in, in a good way. Clear communication. So I've got to say this, this is a very, very key factor for the future for every one of you that, you know, might be finding a work position or will be, will be finding a work position in the future. Clear communication when you're online, it's, it's going to be critical. Okay. So this is uh, one of the aspects that I'm focusing very much now, because if you're not ready to clearly communicate or if you feel you want to um, further develop those soft skills, now is the time. Don't wait for it. Now is the time. Okay. And of course, technology. So I, I have the pleasure of, of working in tech. It's a very fast paced industry, but it's, it's amazing to be part of the focus and to enable this focus, this shift in the market. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a very good place to be. Uh, technology demands that we did some remote work in the past. So it, it was kind of easy for us to adapt. Um, but again, find technology, it's, it's a means to an end, you know? So find the right technology to support your future, your career, and the, the positive impact that you want to bring to your team on your first uh, assignment on, on the company that you're part of, okay? So I'm gonna show you just a very brief video of technology, of augmented reality. This is not a promotion of any brand, okay? It's just to give you an example how well the market is um, using augmented reality, which in this case, you're gonna see that it's worked, it's used in a factory, but there are a lot of examples where this scenario is used at home. Okay, so I'm going to show you very briefly.
So guys, I just realized a friend texted me while the video was playing. I do, I, I do know by this time that he did not hear sound. I'm gonna, you know, ask Senna and, and the team at BAST to share the video with you or maybe the presentation because it, it's interesting to see the ability or the power that technologies can bring to a workforce, okay, or to a company. So, you know, it, it had captions. So I do know that you could read what, what was being said, but again, I'll try to share the video afterwards. So let me just move on because I do believe in Sen. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm going over my time as I think. Um, work relations, will they change? Um, so I'm gonna share what the market is saying. Okay, so one, health above all, like we said. Two, digital everything, okay? So digital um, um, processes, digital work, digital collaboration, digital everything. It's gonna, it's gonna be, it, it is the new normal, you know? The work-life balance and um, adaptability. So the work-life balance and Senna, we were talking a few minutes ago. Um, there's not a very strict answer for that. I'm gonna give you my personal example. When I worked remotely about 10 years ago, I had my own schedule. No one told me, come on, I, I joined Microsoft at that time. There was not you know, someone you know, banging over my shoulder every, every second saying, you have to do this, you have to do that. So you, you, you kind of have to empower yourself. So what I did, I, I did my own schedule. I, oh yeah, I was studying, uh, I was working full-time and studying at night. So it was um, demanding to say the least. Um, but what I did, I had my, I worked, I, I got up as, as if I were to go to the office. I started working at that time about 8.30, 8, 8.30 a.m. of course. Um, I had a, a stop in the middle of the morning. I get out of, the, out of the house, I had a coffee and come back. I work about, you know, lunchtime. I take about 30, 45 minutes for lunch and for a break. I did, you know, the, the same uh, method as the morning. So I stop in the middle of the afternoon, get out of the house. I had about 10, 15 minutes to do so. Uh, I had a coffee, I, I'd come back and I end my day at about nine, uh, sorry, seven uh, PM ish. Um, and that, that was kind of what worked for me, you know? So you really need to find what's your best, best method. But ju just keep in mind that you're gonna have to adapt more frequently and uh, find a method that does not uh, diminish your productivity, you know, and your positive impact on, on the company that you, that you work for. So um, this, this is it. Uh, so and adaptability as well, do, do you consider that, you know, this week you could be working remotely, but by next week, someone's gonna call you and on Monday and say, listen, I need you to be in a couple of meetings next Tuesday, so the day after, or Wednesday, or, or, or Thursday, or, or whatever. So you need to have a system that works for you. You need to be ready to be more adaptive um, and, and do um, have a good schedule. That's gonna help you a lot, okay? So guys, this, this is it. Um, here's my, my email and you can follow us on LinkedIn and so on. Do feel free to share any questions, and I, I don't know if you have any at this time, but uh, do feel free to reach out. I do enjoy uh, talking to everyone and learning uh, with the people that I get in touch with. So, guys, thank you so much. I'm going to pass it over to you, Senna. All right. Uh, thank you, Hugo, for, for this very interesting talk. Uh, can I ask you to uh, stop sharing the screen, and then yep. we can go to a few questions. Uh, we did receive a few. Um, okay. First, uh, do you think we will finally proceed to have shorter working weeks uh, as was predicted decades ago? Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> that is an amazing question. So uh, it's, we don't have time to go over that question, to be honest, but I would say, because it, 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 is, it, it has a lot of deep impact in the industry and, and legally and, and the workforce and the productivity, it's, it's a very difficult question to answer. I'm not going to say that you're going to, you know, you're moving forward uh, to a, a shorter uh, work week, uh, if I understood the question correctly. But I would say that we will all gain, if we have a good system at home or the remote space that we use, 
we will always we will all have um, benefits with this. You know, it's going to be um, if you're not doing a, a, a travel home office every day, you're going to at least 15, 30 minutes. You're going to you're going to take to something else. So that spend it with your wife, with your girlfriend, with studying. I don't know what what makes you happy. You know. So that's going to be really, really important and very much uh, useful and beneficial, I believe, for everyone. Yeah. All right. Thank you. We'll, we'll definitely be, be looking forward to seeing how this indeed uh, actually changes. Um, we received another question, and that is more about uh, remote working and its effect on the social interaction between people. Because uh, right now, there is always still a bit of a need for people to interact, uh, to build relationships with each other in the workplace. Uh, not only for personal gain, but also for the well, for the efficacy of the work. Uh, so, how do you think this can be affecting the work, and how do you think this can be remedied? Yeah, very good question. Um, you know, like I, I was, I was sharing my opinion, and I do think that you cannot be always one hundred percent remote. You're gonna, you're gonna have to meet the person. You know, there's, there's kind of a human connection that cannot be. Um, surpassed if you're remote, you know, it's, you, you need to be there. Uh, so I would say that don't hesitate. If you feel the need to, to socially interact, don't hesitate to do so. Go to the office, go, go shake people's hands, go have a face-to-face -face meeting. Um, do schedule, if, if you're uh, a very long distance away, um, do schedule a business trip and do schedule it for uh, as many advanced time as you can. So if I'm working with a project in Singapore, I, I'm gonna do my budget for the year and I'm gonna, for T&E, travel and expenses and so on. So I'm gonna say, okay, in March and June and August, I don't know, I'm gonna have a business trip there. We're, we're probably gonna work and we're probably gonna have some lunch or dinners or so on because that makes sense. That, that, that also matters. There's, there's a kind of a, a, an emotional component that I, I don't believe you can subtract entirely, you know? So that, that will be my advice. That, that will be what I, what I did and what I will continue to do. Uh, although, yeah, I can work remotely in a very good way. Sometimes I can be more productive as well, but I miss talking to you guys. I miss exchanging ideas, you know? Um, and, and there are some things you could do, do more, more team building events, even remotely. Um, do share your screen when you talk to it, to, to some people call often, you know, use the phone, forget the email. Sometimes use the phone because, um, you know, an email is more, uh, emotionally dry if you get the expression. So I would say use the phone, you know, so find the, the, um, find the approach that works best in each case, but I wouldn't, you know, I, I, I would say that yes, it affects social interaction, but we cannot just overlook it com completely, you know? So try to find a mixed, um, a mixed method, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, th thank you, Jogo, for, for answering this question. It's a, a complicated issue that will probably take many people a lot of time to exactly figure out, uh, just like the previous one about the work week. Um, but uh, sadly, we don't have more time to, to delve into this. Oh, yeah. I'm sure we can keep talking about this for, for hours if need be. Uh, but we'll have to finish this Q&A here. Uh, thank you, Diogo, a lot for being here and sharing your views on the future of work. I believe that all our viewers uh, have gained something from this. Um, you also shared your content information, so uh, I recommend our viewers to reach out in case they have uh, anything else they would like to discuss. Uh, that's it. Uh, thank you, Diogo. And uh, for the other viewers, you can uh, stay tuned for the next keynote about self-sovereign identity uh, related to blockchain um, delivered by a professional from IBM. So stay tuned. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye.
Hello, everybody, once, once again, and thank you so much for continuing with us on, on that side. For, for his next keynote, we are honored to have Mr. Francesco Melcarne from, from IBM with us. IBM International Business Machines Corporation produces and sells computer hardware, middleware, and software, and provides hosting and consulting services in areas ranging from mainframe computers to technology. IBM is also a major research organization holding the record for most US patents generated by a business as of 2020 for 27 consecutive years. Invention by IBM include the automated color machine that you may know as ATM, the floppy disk, and the SQL programming language, among others. IBM is also one of the world's largest employers with more than a third of a million, having already been awarded five Nobel Prizes. Here joining the best virtual summit is Mr. Malkarne. Mr. Malkarne is an executive IT architect at the federal CTO office of IBM in Europe. Having joined IBM in the Center of Research in Rome just after being gra graduated 30 years ago. In all these years, even if he changed many internal organizations and job roles, he was constantly involved in innovation projects, being currently a member of an international team developing solutions for governmental institutions across Europe. He's also part of the International Center Organization Technical Committee 307, preparing, L preparing standards on blockchain, which is the topic of this session. I will now give the word to Mr. McCartney, who will explain to us how blockchain predicted to change both our personal and digital identities management can enable or facilitate new ways of exchanging personal health records for tracking the coronavirus spread, but also to use in many other cases. In the meantime, everybody making us company is more than welcome um, to post questions online, either on Facebook and YouTube, and we hope we'll enjoy this talk as much as we will. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. McCartney. So good afternoon to everybody. I'm going to, to talk about uh, self sovereign identity. self sovereign identity is uh, something that is difficult to pronounce even for mother tongue of people. You can imagine for an Italian, but it is uh, a matter that uh, uh, has a lot of implication, starting from uh, human rights. I mean, identity is something that is uh, at the very core of each individual. But we have to understand better what identity is. So in my, in my presentation, I will devote just a bit of time to define what identities mean. Then I will try to explain, we don't have so much time, what is self-sovereign identity. And afterwards, we will and try to understand how self sovereign identity and blockchain can help combat uh, the pandemics. So, coming into the first subject, what is identity? A lot of confusion on this point because we are customer to define identity in, in many ways. Uh, Mm, it's, not, it's not a simple task, but let's try. Everybody of us uh, has a list, as a portfolio of identity documents uh, defining part of his identity. My name, my surname, my birthplace, my birthday is something that is typically associated with identity. But why not my diploma, my academic title, uh, my nationality, but also my social security number, my loyalty um, number in so many different services, uh, the gym number, you, you can uh, choose what you want. And when we use these, uh, these identities, these identity attributes, we use it uh, in in some interaction to show our identity to someone else. How, how we do it? We show a piece of paper, a plastic card uh, to someone who is able to look at it and find some important information, not only our identity attributes, but also the uh, provenance uh, of these identity attributes. Someone, an issuer, that is a certified issuer that can say, I am Francesco Belcarne, I'm Italian, 
and you can say on my passport that this has been declared by uh, the Ministry of Interior of Italy. So apart from trying to forge some uh, fake identity documents, this is an analog an analogic process that is uh, simply made by humans. The problem is that on the internet, the internet was born without an identity. Each time we interact with a, a service, we need to interact with an identity provider, which gives us typically a, a couple of account and password in order to let us in, in the service. So we have on a side, a wallet of uh, identity cards and in our mind, or someone is uh, noting in them on, on some little sheet of paper, uh, a lot of credentials. Um, I recently read that in the average, we have some 191 couple of credentials, a big amount of credentials for any kind of services from government, from any kind of goods and service provider. So, but this does not change the fact that uh, as, an, as a, a very old joke says, you can say uh, to be uh, who you want on the internet. So let let take a look of uh, a bit of a sort of history, of the escalation of the of the kind of uh, uh, identity services provided to us uh, by different identity service provider. So either we register ourselves with a service uh, that gives us an account and a password, typically, so centralized uh, identity provisioning. Or sometimes we can use a single account to access many different services as it's typically done in uh, governmental services. You can get different services from different agencies, but you can use a single uh, couple of credentials. But also sometimes, and this is called federated uh, identity. Also sometimes uh, you can be offered in front of a new service you want to access and you need to register to that service, you are kindly offered to use one of your social network password uh, in order to avoid to create a new uh, credential. This is user centric. You feel that like something that uh, pertains to you and belongs to you. We are talking about something new. Right? the decentralized identity in, in some minutes. Because and this is a point that we will take into consideration, um, this user-centric approach is something that is not uh, like it in many environments. As an example, the European Union Commission wants to avoid European Union citizens and business to use social network credential uh, in order not to provide these identity providers information that can be used to profile your experience uh, on the web. So that's because centralized and federated, federated identity model has this problem that when an issuer issue a digital identity to a holder and the holder present it to a verifier, the verifier has to call back to the issuer uh, in order, sorry, I don't know. Um, the verifier has to come back to the issuer and disclose the fact that the holder has shown to him uh, this credential. So a bit of information is given back to the issuer that can collect it. self sovereign identity, what is self sovereign identity? I have a dream someone told in the past, but let's say that 
the community of people interested into self-sovereign identity have, have a dream identity management system with all these requirements, apparently fighting each against the other. So let's imagine that instead of having a set of personal uh, identity cards and a set of digital identities, I can get rid of credentials and use my personal identity. As an example, I've, I could have been given an ident a personal identity certification and I can use it directly because I'm Italian to enter into the Italian governmental services with a, without the need to apply for credentials to enter it. This without uh, canceling the previous system, but integrating it. And this is another point very interesting because a lot of debate uh, is running against uh, a self-serving identity system um, hosted by governmental uh, organization. You can imagine that as it is done uh, normally on the web for any kind of services, if the service providing you uh, goods or services doesn't want to know your real personal identity, um, you can, in, in this new system, create a sort of avatar where you invent, uh, let's say, a fake or a new personal identity and use that to enter the services. Another important point, imagine a system where the administrator of the system run the system, but don't know nothing about you. And again, Another point is that the owner can decide to whom to show his or her attribute identity. And even more, uh, you can imagine a scenario like that. You arrive at an airport uh, and you want to uh, hire a car. You show to the, to the clerk your identity card where the identity card, the driving license, uh, and uh, uh, obviously a credit card. In my identity card, my name, surname, birthday, birthplace is shown. Birthla birthplace is not interesting to the clerk. And also my marital status. Why I have to show my marital status to the clerk? It's not important for the transaction we are going to run, uh, except my profession and all this stuff. You can imagine a system where you can tailor the information you give uh, to the verifier. Again, another point that is important that the system leave the responsibility of issuing personal attributes to the usual issuer of these attributes. Uh, in Italy, the Ministry of Transportation gives you a driving license. It will be in the future, the Ministry of Transportation of transportation to give you a driving license. The same is for my personal identity that is normally issued on an identity card by the Ministry of Interior uh, or the municipality, it will be the same in Italy. Another important point is that privacy is uh, protected. GDPR is complied with. This seems a miracle, but it's the subject of the self-sovereign identity. How we arrive at that? It's the convergence of maturing standardization on the field of uh, personal attributes in the W3C and DIF are defining how personal attributes are exchanged and also by the advent of the blockchain technology. I have no time to enter into many details now. Uh, there is a huge literature on that, but you can imagine that for the technical people in the audience, we should move from a traditional public key infrastructure uh, where you need a central certification authority that gives you certificates in order to exchange couples of private and public keys to a decentralized PKI where you don't need 
a single certification authority, but the certification authority is in a public blockchain ledger. So how things change with the self-sovereign identity? Let's imagine you have been recently graduated at university. You are now a doctor. The university issued to you the credential, the personal attributes, giving you the diploma, signs this credential. The signature is made with a public key that is um, stored on the blockchain. So the only the public key are on the blockchain. Public key is something that is public. It should have been public even without a blockchain. So no secret disclosed. This is called zero knowledge proof. So you have this credential signed by the university. You get it, you sign it again with your private key. So, uh, so the public key is again on the blockchain and you give this credential with this double signature to the final verifier, which can be, as an example, an hospital if you're a doctor that wants to hire you. The hospital can verify that you are you because he finds your signature on the blockchain, uh, your public key on the blockchain. So it can decrypt this credential. Again, it has to decrypt again because it has to find on the public blockchain the public key of the university issue that issued your academic title. So, so the hospital can read eventually uh, your personal information and decide what to do with your application of being hired. We arrived very fast to the point. Okay, you gave us uh, uh, this fantastic scenario of self sovereign identity, this use of the blockchain to free ourselves of all this amount of uh, identity, digital identities. What this has to do with the pandemics? Yes, mm, I, I'm, I borrow it uh, part of uh, a very interesting document uh, by the Blockchain Research Institute uh, about one of the use of self sovereign identity and blockchain in general in time of pandemics. If you, uh, if you look at the point, uh, if we need, and in any uh, pandemics and epidemic approach, um, let's say, to try to control uh, epidemic, you need a big amount of data. So the question are how many people are infected, where we are located, uh, how many people are, have met them, etc. This multiplied by the population, it's a big amount of data. Would it be big or small amount of data? The problem is that these data are very personal. My blood pressure, my temperature, not to mention the status of my antibody, my blood, is something I, I cannot think of, nothing more personal than that. So unless uh, we are in a dictatorship, you definitely need to authorize this, uh, the approach to, to this data. And each citizen in the world wants to cooperate with, uh, with the central authorities in order to fight this pandemic for sure, but wants to be sure that their data has, are used by someone they know for the goal that we know, and they don't, they cannot replicate that to anyone else, cannot disclose that. And each time that data is used, you are, uh, you know about that. This is an important point. Uh, maybe it couldn't be used currently because we are not still, uh, there are not still a large amount of these systems around the world. But for the future, could be important. More, more than this, it's important the fact that uh, it's not only a problem of uh, 
privacy seen from the single individual is also a problem of uh, uh, this kind of personal attributes are not forgeable. You cannot say, I can say I am another person uh, if my real personal identity comes from the municipality of Rome as an example. So I cannot show a different health status if uh, they have to be certified by a medical institution, an hospital, etc. So I cannot forge my status because I want to, to get back at work, even if I'm ill or vice versa. I want to show to be ill uh, in order not to avoid working. So with this system, there is a no repudiation. Other points for sure, for blockchain in general, not so not only self-sovereign identity, is on the fact that blockchain is a trust machine. And uh, the effort of, for, of combating uh, this virus could, could reach success uh, e more easily when uh, there is a common sharing of information. When you share information, you want to, to be certain that you have shared information and no one again uh, can say that you shared something that is not good or, or comes from a different source. Blockchain is the engine that creates the right trust for sharing information, so in research. Even more, and, and this is my last example, um, blockchain is something that is strictly linked with um, supply chain provenance um, ver verification. So you can imagine that here, um, supply chain for uh, goods, for uh, pharmaceutical goods, etc., are of the utmost importance. So, having such a supply chain certified or laying over a blockchain uh, is something that will facilitate uh, all these efforts. I think I can elaborate on many of these aspects uh, with many drill down, but that's it on my side for today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Matarne. Thank you very much for the very, for the very interesting talk. Um, I will, um, I will uh, stop sharing now at the presentation so, um, so that we can interact face to face again. Um, thank you. We have um, time for one, uh, one or two questions. The first one will be, um, how do you, um, if, if individuals are free to create more than one identity, as you have, as you have mentioned, um, how do you, how do you think that like the fears of having identity falsification and, and, and how that can be uh, pre prevented, how can we combat that? With this, um, watching. Yes, you are free to create uh, uh, any identity you want, but the identity you create is not uh, a certification. You cannot verify that someone of the official institution has signed your identity. So it's clear that it's something that you created. If someone to to you uh, to whom you uh, show this, let's say invented identity is uh, happy with that and let you enter uh, is okay for sure when, when someone as an example you can imagine one of the largest provider of goods around the globe is not interested into your real identity is more interested to your credit card and your address because it has to deliver the goods to to your to your home if you are francesco malcarne or are uh, uh, Giovanni uh, Rossi, um, this is not important for them. So they are happy with any identity you create uh, as far as your address is a real physical address and your credit card is covered is a real credit card. That's, that's the answer. Thank you. And finally, one last question. Um, from seeing uh, the description of how we can use this uh, to uh, track and to combat the pandemics, I see that uh, you, re 
you rely um, a lot on the social responsibility and willingness of uh, individuals and citizens to provide their data. Um, however, we have seen that in some countries, pe pe people don't trust the governments as much um, to, ma to maybe reach that, that level of sending their data. I know that like indeed, everything would be anonymized if people would want and would be taken care of. But do you think that like this can pose as an obstacle if people don't trust the governments to provide the data? This is not covered by self-sovereign identity for sure. I mean, uh, if you want it, it's the opposite. Uh, I have more control on my personal data. If I don't trust uh, in the government, uh, I have a mechanism not to share my personal data against my my personal opinion and and willing uh, above all okay okay thank you very much um Ms. Ms. McCartney for being with us um for everybody um on that on that on that side please don't forget to stay tuned for our upcoming session what does it take to be a sustainable company nowadays and why does it matter coming up next by Athena Nosiopolo communication and C S R coordinator at Isomat. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back to this next keynote. Um, this keynote is about what does it take to be a sustainable company nowadays and what it means. A lot has been said about corporate social responsibility, corporate responsibility and sustainability uh, in general uh, these past few years. In fact, in the past two decades, we've seen the rise of these terms, which were previously known only to a few. So what is this all about? What does it take to be a sustainable company? To answer these questions, we have with us Athena Nusiopoulou, who is the Communications and Corporate Social Responsibility Coordinator at Isomat. Isomat is a producer of building chemicals and mortars with a multinational perspective and is very committed to innovation and the constant development of new products. At Isomat, Athena uh, coordinates activities such as financial support and sponsorship programs to all types of stakeholders supporting the company in developing, managing, and altering social responsibility policies, as well as promoting this internally. Previously, actually, she also worked a lot on startup innovation uh, and in a positive ecosystem uh, for startups. Now, how important is it for companies nowadays to adopt strategies that make them not only appear, but actually be sustainable? This is uh, what Athena will also be, be discussing. Before we start, I would like to remind our viewers that you are all very welcome to post your questions for Athena in the comments on this stream, either in YouTube or in Facebook. That said, I will gladly give the floor to Athena to share with us her thoughts on what it takes to be a sustainable company these days. Athena, go ahead. Thank you very much, Sene, for the introduction and for the welcoming keynote. So now it's about time for me to share with you my, uh, my keynotes. I'm just trying to find here my presentation. <laughs> Uh, oh, sorry, it must be somewhere here. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry about the delay. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, okay, I think that we are on now, doing about the presentation here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sene, again, for the introduction here. Uh, so, what am I going to talk to you about is that what does it take to be a sustainable company nowadays? And why does it matter? Why is it important for you to know why is it important? So this is the table of our contents of our presentation. First, we're going to have a, a definition of what is CSR or corporate social responsibility, corporate responsibility and sustainability. What does it take to be a sustainable company nowadays? The importance for companies to adopt strategies to abate sustainable and responsible companies? What do they gain or lose if they don't support sustainable strategies? Do consumers or other stakeholders actually appreciate and reward sustainable companies? Now we're going to check a bit to see about what COVID-19 pandemic crisis did actually towards this direction. And by closing our remark, we're going to talk about Isomat. What is my company doing and how does it do it and its sustainable st stigma? So first of all, we're going to the first thing. What is the definition of the term? What is CSR? The best definition of CSR, which is corporate social responsibility or sustainability, is the responsibility of enterprises for their impacts on society, environment, marketplace, and the workplace. It is obvious that in the last 15 or 20 years, there have been very important changes and development during this direction. From charity, we are now moving on to something that is now almost mandatory. And in many cases, there is also legislation about companies that have to deal with corporate responsibility. There are serious European legislation for companies in the stock market that employ more than 500 people and is required to public a kind of reporting, I suppose many of you know that, on these issues. They're talking about when we're talking about the environment, marketplace, and the workplace and society in general. So, what does sustainability mean for a company? Sustainability in companies generally address, addresses to four main pillars first, to employees, then to the environment, third, to the society, and fourth, to the marketplace when we're talking about customers, suppliers, etc. The goal of a sustainable company strategy is to have a positive impact in all these areas. When companies fail to assume responsibility, the opposite can actually happen, leading to issues like, among others, environmental degradation, inequality, social injustice, reputation lose, potential crisis, of course, for the company. 
But is the company actually uh, trying to follow sustainable programs and strategies? What does it have to gain? Of course, its public image is improved. And this is crucial. As consumer assess the company public image when deciding whether they want to buy from it or not. Something simple like staff members volunteering an hour a week at a charity. And if they're going to do with that, the brand is committed to helping others. As a result, that actually appears much more favorable to consumers. Increase the brand awareness and recognition is, is increased. If the company is committed to ethical practices, of course, that will be spread. More people will therefore hear about the brand, which actually creates an increased brand awareness. The cost savings. Many simple changes in favor of sustainability, such as using less, pack less packaging, will decrease the production costs. We have, of course, an advantage over other competitors. By embracing CSR, a company actually embraces CSR, the company stands out from the other competitors and the regular industry. It establishes itself as a company committed to going one step further by considering the other social and environmental factors. Of course, we actually at the same time have increased customer engagement. By the use of sustainable systems, the company can post it on every media channel and create a story out of its efforts. Furthermore, it should show its effort to local media outlets in the hope that they will give it some coverage. Customers will follow this and engage with the brand and the operations as well. And this is actually something that we're doing in Zomad and I will explain to you later. What actually happened? What are also the benefits when a company does CSR strategy? Greater employee engagement. Similar to customer engagement, then companies should also need to ensure that the companies know CSR strategies. It is proven that employees enjoy working for a company that has a good public image than one that doesn't have. And last but not least, more benefits for the employees. There are also a range of benefits for the employees when the company embraces CSR. Workplace will be a more positive and productive place to work. And by promoting things like volunteering, personal and professional growth is encouraged. So we can see from the above that beyond helping curb the global challenges, sustainability can drive business success. An important number of investors and funds today use environmental, social, and governments, or else as we call it, ESG metrics to, uh, to account an organization's ethical impact and sustainable practices. Investors look at factors such as a company's carbon footprint or the water waste, community development efforts, in order to see how they are doing and so to, to know, to want or not to invest in this company. Companies with high ESG ratings out of a result of sustainable strategies have a lower cost of debt and equity and improve financial performance while fostering public support. There is also a very nice slide here, which uh, summarizes all the above in, uh, in, a, in, the most, in the most perfect way for me. We have corporate social responsibility in the middle and around it, all the benefits that a company actually gains when it's doing uh, social, uh, corporate social responsibility strategies. Of course, as we said before, uh, there is a, a development of uh, an improvement of its brand and corporate reputation. We have uh, government, environmental, social, and governance improvement as well, diversity and inclusivity, corporate citizenship, and we have philanthropy and volunteering among the employees, business practices and principles are improving the company, and what else? Help the environment as well. So under these circumstances, do consumers and stakeholders embrace sustainable companies? In the bottom line, yes, of course. Consumers prefer people-friendly organizations and environmental protection. The days when uh, consumers made a purchase decision based strictly on product quality and price are, does no longer exist. Today's consumers are much more demanding 
and they have shown a significant preference for the environment and people-friendly organizations. Uh, there has been um, an investigation um, a few years ago, uh, which uh, actually said some light on, on the topic, saying that 55% of respondents reported being willing to pay more for product services from companies committed to positive, to, to positive social and environmental impact. 52% of respondents reporting purchasing at least one product or service in the past six months from a socially responsible company. Four out of 10 respondents reported they made a sustainable purchase in the preceding six months. And closing, we could say that 52% of respondents say their purchase decision was at least partially affected by social and environmental impact labels, notifications on packaging. So we can see uh, that, of course, under these circumstances, yes, a company should use uh, sustainable strategies. And even now, after, uh, since we're going through still the COVID-19 pandemic crisis, uh, companies, um, looks, uh, this looks like it will act as a catalyst when it comes to matters of CSR, as the conditions that emerge lead dozens of companies to act promptly by announcing and implementing programs to support the public health sector and effect programs to assist population groups that were hit in various ways by the pandemic, as well their employees. What actually changed is that companies that had not previously adopted similar programs or did not follow CSR practices responded to this crisis. This is a very good development and can be used as the basis towards taking their next steps in sustainability. Because even the companies that have not done much so far will recognize the value of these programs and the strategy and little by little, as long as economic conditions of course allow the situation, will work in that direction. And when companies work with a purpose, they achieve greater added value, of course, for both the society and the business itself. So what do we do in Isomat? First of all, uh, with all our strategies, we defend basic human rights. We defend individual and vulnerable groups through our programs. Support, and that has to do, of course, with the society and with our employees. Support charitable associations, organizations support to other relevant agencies as well. Uh, we support employees, our employees, we ensure safe and healthy working conditions, justness in the treatment of our employees, ensuring a fair system of remuneration and benefits, and continuous training through technical educational seminars. We also support our local community. We have employee recruitment from, from there, 